What is up, Bitcoiners? It's CK. And this morning I woke up to Bitcoin breaching 50K. My body woke me up at 4 a.m. in the morning. Um, but I'm sure glad I woke up for it. I, I don't know. I have like this crazy body clock. I think I also woke up as we were breaking uh, the all-time highs um, in the middle or like early in the morning as well. Uh, so I guess Bitcoiners are just in tune or something. Um, Ansel, how are you doing? Were you, uh, were you awake during the, the 50K breach? Oh, yeah. I was on my Discord saying, hey, we're pushing up, we're pushing up. And then it broke and everyone was cheering on, on Discord. So, yeah, it was, it's a good time. And it's funny how it does happen in the morning right after the weekend. Yeah. Is that a trend? I haven't really been uh, keeping track of that mentally. Um, yeah, Mondays usually seem to be pretty big price movement days. So, and then we had the holiday in the U S yesterday. So it's kind of like a Monday today. Yeah. Well, I know that, uh, I used to do my doubt, my automatic dollar cost average on Tuesday and it was working fine, like for the, for the most part. And then all of a sudden when things got bullish, that Tuesday buy was like the, the most expensive buy the entire week. So I actually flipped it to Friday buys. So maybe you are right. Um, but that Tuesday was painful. Uh, I think like pretty much going from like 18 all the way to 25. I was like, man, I'm getting the top of every single week with this buy. Yeah, I don't know why that is, whether it's like wire transfers come in on Mondays um, or whether it's um, like just the price action with CME because the CME gaps that open up on the weekend and then it tries to close the gap right before we open on Monday, something like that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting. So uh, we don't need to get into uh, the nuances of Bitcoin price quite yet. We have an absolutely jam-packed show for you guys. Antel has put together a lot of notes since we last kind of gave a central banking update. Uh, but we got notes on the central bank, the ECB, uh, a little bit about the PBOC and, uh, and Bank of Japan. And then, of course, we got to talk about Bitcoin momentum. It just things are on fire and it seems like uh, all of the Bitcoin maximalist narratives um, are being adopted, which uh, is extremely exciting. Um, but before we get into it, let's talk about our sponsors. First, we got Blockstack. Blockstack's the Stacks 2.0 blockchain. It is a great example of Bitcoin being adopted as the de facto money of the cryptocurrency space. The Blockstacks blockchain has a token that you can stake in order to secure the blockchain, but you get paid out in sets. And on their native blockchain, they use proof of transfer in order to uh, peg in BTC. So um, Bitcoin is the money on the Blockstacks blockchain. You can do a lot of different decentralized finance and decentralized application um, stuff on there. They have a ton of great applications already built. Go check it out at stacks2.com, stack 2com and learn more about how the Stacks2 blockchain is leveraging Bitcoin to enable decentralized applications. Next, I got to show the Bitcoin 2021 conference down in beautiful, sunny Miami, Florida, probably the most Bitcoin friendly and the most freedom respecting city and Florida being the most freedom respecting state in the United States right now. It has really been incredible to see them shine and kind of make the West Coast and make a lot of the other major cities uh, look really, really bad. So, uh, you know, Florida is a great place to be and it is an awesome place for Bitcoin 2021. We have amazing speakers, Jack Dorsey, Chamath, Nick Zabo, even Tony Hawk gonna tell his Bitcoin story. He's been riding the wave since 2016. Uh, and guys, every single Bitcoiner is going to be there. If you know them, if they're in the United States, they've already purchased tickets. Tickets are flying off the shelves. We are pushing promo code SATOSHI, all caps, SATOSHI, inside of both OpenNode or Eventbrite. If you're trying to buy with Bitcoin or Fiat, you can use promo code SATOSHI to get 10% off of your ticket. Don't wait. Tickets are going up and we have a very limited capacity, a hard cap, if you will, on how many folks can be there because of uh, just, re you know, regulations around uh, venue capacity and stuff like that. We are being very compliant, working very close with the mayor's office, but we are making this event happen in 2021 in person. So you guys go to b.tc backslash conference right now. Use code Satoshi to save 10% on your Bitcoin 2021 tickets. All right, Ansel, let's get into this show. That's enough of me. 
All right, I just have a correction. You said Tony Hawk was riding a wave. He's riding a half pipe. Isn't that the, the skateboarder term? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, hey, we're only going up, baby. <laughs> only going up. And I apologize to those watching on YouTube. I threw up my back, and so I'm kind of pacing here at my standing desk. And so I don't mean to be distracting with my swaying. But anyways, okay, yeah, let's start. Should we start with the Fed? Is that what you want to start with? or? Yes, sir. Let's go. Okay, so... This isn't a comprehensive review since the last time we talked about it. This is really just in the last week, Jerome Powell made some comments that I thought were pretty interesting. And so um, I provided a link in our show notes for those uh, comments and an article writing, writing them up. Um, the big thing is that they are focused now on unemployment versus inflation. So they're not even worried about inflation. They are taking it for granted that they're going to get to their 2% target. Uh, they're not worried about overshooting the inflation target. They are worried about unemployment. And it's interesting. He said um, specifically that the BLS numbers, so the Bureau of Labor Statistics in the United States, uh, their official unemployment rate of 6.3%, uh, quote, dramatically understates the jobs lost in 2020. So I thought that was kind of interesting that they're contradicting each other, BLS and the Fed, and uh yeah so what do you think about that yeah i mean it's interesting because people have been questioning these official numbers for a long time so it's really interesting to see both that the fed is kind of taking it into their own hands as well as again seeing him uh signal that he does not think the numbers actually represent the pain that americans are feeling yeah and dramatically which i thought was kind of a shot across the bow like hey guys you know, we're doing everything we can. We're trying to measure the numbers up here and you guys are understating the numbers and not doing your fiscal responsibility to, to stimulate. So I just thought it was kind of uh, interesting back and forth. I mean, um, on that note, this is not the first time that we've seen Powell kind of say, we're doing what we can, you know, yeah. what about you? Like the first time it was with legislators and trying to push for that second round of stimulus, which is taking forever like, it's really unbelievable to see, like, how long it's taking to push out this measly $2,000 of help to the American people. Um, okay, next, he commented on temporary versus st sustained inflation. And he said that with stimulus, that usually leads to temporary shocks of inflation versus sustained inflation. Um, and so he's like, uh, he kind of updated his overshoot target. Remember, this was back in 2000 and, well, last year, 2020. And after two-year review, they came back out and said, our policy was correct. We just tightened too early. So we don't want to do that. We want to let the economy run hot a little bit before we start raising rates and, and uh, doing tightening. Uh, so that's where they said they're going to let it uh, overshoot the 2% target. But here, he kind of corrected that a little bit and said, well, the temporary shock can be over 2%. So it, that's, that is a change from saying they're going to let it run hot over 2% to saying a temporary shock, will, they will let that go over 2%. Um, but I think the broader implication of what he said there, though, is that he realizes the difference between sustained growth and just a temporary stimulus. And We've been talking about this. People like us have been talking about this for a long time, that uh, stimulus is not a replacement for spending in the economy. But you wouldn't think that if you just listen to central bankers. They think, oh, you know, we're going to stimulate. We're going to save the economy. Don't fight the Fed. We're going to prop this up. Um, so I thought that was pretty interesting. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's just really interesting to see them kind of go through these mental gymnastics almost in order to justify what they're doing and even justify why what they're doing was incorrect in the past, um, how they're adjusting. Um, again, I think a big message of this podcast has been like, these guys don't know what they're doing. They are figuring it out in real time, just like us, even though they're making these kind of massive decisions that have massive uh, second, third, fourth order effects uh, that they are not measuring, they're still going about just kind of like driving in the dark. So, um, you know, effectively, every time you kind of dig up these statements, uh, you're proving that point. Yeah, and I, I like to push back all the time on the idea that these, these central bankers are omnipotent and they can do what they say. 
They say we're going to print money and we're going to get inflation. And we haven't seen that, right? We haven't seen a uh, runaway inflation. So I just like to push back and say, hey, these guys don't know what they're doing. Just like you just said, they don't know what they're doing. They're flailing and they're always late to the party on every single recession and every single bubble. Um, so yeah, should we go on to the ECB now? Yeah, another central bank, another not optimistic <laughs> central bankers that, I mean, again, really not in touch. Did you see the tweet? I did, and I, I cringed really hard. <laughs> so they had this Valentine's Day tweet, and it read, Roses are red, violets are blue. We'll keep financing conditions favorable till the crisis is through. And man, was there some backlash. It was just, you know, pretty tone deaf to the suffering going on out there, trying to make light, trying to make a joke of this whole thing. Um, I can kind of see how maybe they were trying to, you know, add a little levity into the, into a, a very bad situation, but man, it did not go over well with people on Twitter. I don't know if it's because my follow list is skewed towards Bitcoiners, but every single time the ECB tweets or one of these central bankers tweets, it's just a DDoS of Bitcoiners just commenting on it. And <laughs> it's it's almost like it, they overwhelm uh, every single thing that they put out on Twitter. Uh, and I think that's bullish because... You know, everyone who's paying attention, if they look into the comments, just Bitcoin, 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 Bitcoin. It's, uh, it's a very strong statement. Well, it's also interesting that there's not more people that comment on the ECB. Even the Federal Reserve, their Twitter handle, when they, when they tweet, there's Bitcoiners are the only people, not even gold bugs, really get on there and respond. So, yeah, I mean, BIS, all that. Bitcoiners are the only ones paying attention. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I think if you want to be sharp, if you want to understand what's happening in macro, like you got to look towards Bitcoiners. That is where the signal is. And we're seeing macro guys talking to Bitcoiners more, which indicates that, and talking about Bitcoin more, which I think indicates that, you know, we're onto something here. Yeah. And it's, it's those macro guys aren't responding. They're not like quoting that tweet and making a comment about it. It's only Bitcoiners. And so I think, Really, Bitcoin is this island of, uh, I don't know what you would call it, monetary savvy people. That uh, there, this is the signal. Bitcoiners are the signal. I think macro shows, for the most part, are kind of noise, as well as everything that the ECB or BIS or the Fed usually puts out is a lot of noise. So I don't want to take shots at a previous guest, but I kind of do. Uh, Danielle DiMartino <laughs> Booth, who is our first guest on the podcast at yeah. sub 10K prices, you know, didn't really take the podcast super seriously, didn't take Bitcoin super seriously at the time. Um, but, you know, she retweeted Anthony Pompliano 50K meme saying, you know, fundamentals like it, it, as like sarcastically as possible on Twitter. And, you know, I just commented, I was like, hey, we had you on to talk about Bitcoin fundamentals in you know 2020 prior to even surpassing 10k like you didn't care then like you weren't paying attention then like what you know what are you doing like being sarcastic about us breaking 50k when you were blind you know she she didn't even have an opinion other than you know it's not gold which again is looking like a really bad trade you know in hindsight so uh yeah these macro people they're not paying attention they're resting on their laurels and a lot of the gold bugs they're used to losing they're, Bitcoin is doing yes. what they thought gold would do. Like Bitcoin is doing it and they're crying about it. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm a lot of those macro people, especially um, Danielle. I think that she has some things right, but I would say 75% of what she usually puts out there needs to be more digested before she says it because it's, um, I don't know. I don't think she has a very good read on the economy in general. If, if you don't get where Bitcoin fits, you're getting it wrong. Yeah. Okay. So let's jump into ECB here. Other than the roses are red, violets are blue tweet. So they, they had a, this conference and I'm going to pull this up because I want to read a few lines if that's okay. All right. So um, the headline is ECB issues, stark warning on big tech cryptocurrency projects. Um, and th there, this covers this article covers a lot of ground here. So um, this Fabio Panetta, member of ECB's executive board and chair of the task force on the digital euro, speaking at an online event hosted by Brussels think tank Bruegel on Wednesday, February 10th. Big tech firms, Panetta said, are seeking to sidestep traditional distribution networks 
including payment systems through their control of social media. Data-driven models could jeopardize privacy and pose the risk of personal information being misused. Moreover, integration with other services provided by big tech companies may threaten competition through uh, tying, bundling, cross-subsidization, and winner-takes-all dynamics, he added. Moreover, Panetta said that the stability of the financial markets could be at risk due to the rapid take of cryptocurrencies that large tech firms may be able to achieve with their uh, expansive consumer base. Quote, big tech may contribute to a rapid take up of stable coins, which could create systemic risks and even endanger monetary sovereignty, he said. In the same breath, meanwhile, Panetta took the opportunity to pitch the ECB's own plans for a digital euro, a decision on which is expected to be put forth in April. He noted that such a project would, quote, give access to safe illiquid, I think he meant safe and liquid asset, which unlike cash and in the absence of design related constraints could potentially be held in large amounts at no cost. Um, the ECB recently closed a public consultation on its future plans for a digital euro, which resulted in privacy being the number one concern among stakeholders. I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, continuing on, it's Quote, it is true that if we want to guarantee the stability of the system and enforce those limits that I mentioned before, the maximum holdings of the digital euro, we cannot guarantee 100% privacy on larger payments. And the limit they're talking about is they floated this 3,000 euro threshold for digital euro balance that you, you an individual wouldn't be able to hold more than 3,000 euros, uh, which... Lol. Yeah, I mean, they just talked about... Uh, large volumes at no cost. And then they say that it's uh, only 3000 euros. So, okay, let's see. This gets more interesting down here. Um, the ECB is considering additional privacy protocols that could be implemented in the digital euro, including the option of making small transactions, quote, totally anonymous, end quote, as well as being conducted offline. Panetta also revealed that the ECB was mulling over the possibility of issuing anonymity vouchers. To use for uh, to users of the digital euro, quote would you would have a voucher and you could spend it in a way that it is not tracked by the system, and would allow you to keep full control of your confidential and personal data. Panetta said. More generally, the chair of the digital euro task force conceded that there is likely to be a trade-off between the efficient operations of the digital euro and privacy standards in the future. Quote, there is no tension, there is a tension between controlling and guaranteeing the functioning of the system and protection of privacy. At a certain point, that trade-off should be analyzed not only by the central bank, but by the public at large. And that's where I'll stop on that. What's your uh, takeaway on this? Very interesting. Uh, full of contradictions, right? And yeah. it kind of just shows you're not going to have large amount it's not going to compete with bitcoin and being a store of value it's like they're they're larping that privacy is important and i know that europeans use cash a lot more than anecdotally that they use cash a lot more than americans um at least like the average you know middle class european i feel like americans are really on the credit cards at this point and debit cards uh but I mean, I just think it's LARPing at this point, like in the same breath, they say privacy is still important and you can hold large balances in this liquid currency. But, you know, if we get past 3000, we're going to have to do KYC on that. So it's like, OK, yeah. like this is not going to compete with Bitcoin. And again, uh, it's kind of hilarious that they both, you know, see you know, tech companies and tech networks as being and stable coins as being this huge threat. And they are not even seeing Bitcoin whatsoever. Like personally, I see stable coins as a medium term solution. And I can see why they're sweating over USD stable mm -hmm. coins. But you know, it's just a smokescreen for what's really happening, in my opinion, which and again, I've been saying this, like these guys aren't ready for Bitcoin whatsoever. Yeah, and I, they're, they're learning on the fly here, which I think is very, very interesting. At least I think the central banks are now ahead of a lot of altcoiners, though, because Bitcoiners understand there's a lot of trade-offs, right? We can't have a million transactions per second because the, of blockchain bloat and spam. So there's a trade-off between how many transactions per second and the size of the blockchain and your decentralization. Um, and there's all sorts of trade-offs like that in Bitcoin. And Bitcoiners understand those things. All coiners usually don't. 
they think, you know, oh, well, it's technologically possible to do this. So let's do it. Well, you don't get that there's a trade-off. If you do that, then you can't do something else. And central bankers are learning that and they seem to be uh, already gra- graduating past the altcoiner phase. Thoughts on that? Not shocked that they're smarter than altcoiners, but uh, also it's pretty clear they're not smarter than Bitcoiners. And when it comes to money, altcoiners are completely confused. That's been the the common thread I've seen. And, you know, uh, unfortunately or fortunately, I, you know, interact with Ethereans and altcoiners quite a bit. And I can confirm that the majority of them, they just don't have appreciation for the monetary side of things. Agreed. Should we move on to the PBOC and the BOJ? Yes, Lead us okay. away, man. There, there's not much going on here. Um, the PBOC, you know, they're pretty quiet. This is Lunar New Year. And so they don't want to have any bad headlines or anything going on around Lunar New Year. They did add some liquidity back into the system. There's been a lot of, I would say it's kind of like flying by the seat of their pants. So other central banks, they have policy. <laughs> like The Fed does $120 billion in QE every month. That is the 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 quote unquote liquidity that they inject into the system. China, it's like different every week. And sometimes you have, you know, Monday, oh, they have a surprise uh, liquidity injection. And then Friday, they take half of that back out of the market. They just kind of go willy nilly on this stuff. But other than that, there's, there's no real big news out of China. And on the Bank of Japan, the big news there is that um, they, the Nikkei broke up to 30 year highs in their stock market. So since 1991, when they had their all time high blow off top. And uh, so that's, that's a pretty big deal. And now they're starting a BOJ bank of Japan review of their policy because they're saying, okay, maybe we're getting some growth here. Should we review our policy? Should we cut back on buying ETFs? Should we cut back on buying all this stuff? So that's what they're going to be starting in March. Um, That's it. It only took the Bank of Japan buying literally all the ETFs for them to get back to their all-time highs. What, was it 30 years later? Yes. Well, no, they're not even at their all-time highs. They're still like 10 or 20% below their all-time blow-off top. But uh, they have, you know, they're the highest in 30 years. So, yeah. And I think they own, what, 75% of the ETFs in Japan. Seems healthy. Yeah. I mean, and... It would be really interesting if they did decide to like tone it down and see, you know, what happens there. Maybe they get uh, an even more accelerated uh, kind of experience to what the Fed felt like in uh, two. What was it, two thousand eighteen? Yeah. Well, the the Bank of Japan has done everything QE related uh, first by five to ten years. So whatever Japan decides to do in March, that's what the Fed will decide to do in like two or three years down the road. So let's uh, let's jump from the noise, the central bank noise and updates to let's talk about Bitcoin hype. Um, you know, obviously, uh, you you were feeling bullish. Um, you you mentioned that um, you know you've uh, kind of seen opportunities to go long Bitcoin, and the bearishness has kind of uh, been wrung out. Um, how are you feeling about Bitcoin price these days? Yeah, I put out uh, my member newsletter for Bitcoin and markets and I do a lot of charts and have like a sentiment type of index. And I was slightly bearish for most of that um, consolidation that we just went through between 42 and 29,000. I thought we were going to go a little bit lower, but uh, it has broken up and there's no reason in my mind to be bearish at this point. Um, The fundamentals are ridiculously strong. I, I just saw somebody tweet about what is it? 10,000 Bitcoins a week are coming off of Coinbase going into cold storage, something like that. Yeah. So the, the, the sneaky thing about uh, the glass node metrics is that, you know, they take into account like the exchange wallets, but they're not taking into account uh, like Coinbase custody, right? They don't count that in their, uh, in their analysis. So yeah, okay, you know, these folks are taking it off of exchange wallets, and maybe they're putting it into their own storage, maybe they're putting it into Coinbase custody. Um, We know that GBTC, uh, uh, sorry, uh, Grayscale puts all of those coins into Coinbase custody and, you know, 
that's been just a black hole for Bitcoin. Um, and then we know that Coinbase is and other ex- custodians are custodying a large percentage of uh, these corporate held coins. Uh, so kind of between those two things, uh, you know, Bitcoiners are getting excited about this idea of folks, you know, removing coins out of, you know, third party hands. And I don't know if that's necessarily true. Uh, but for sure, it is true that coins are going from kind of a hot or exchange setting to a cold hodl setting, which is absolutely bullish. Yeah, I wanted to, I want to push back on the GBDC stuff. Is those are still liquid coins? Uh, they're not. So GBTC, uh, the shares can are liquid, but it's actually a one way trust. So the only way that those coins can actually leave Coinbase custody or whatever uh, custody provider that they're working with is if they actually dissolve the trust. So the right. trust as it is, uh, you know, it's a one-way function, which is uh, right. But you, you can know, still it trade is a long those. hodl. You can still yeah. Trade I mean those. yeah yeah they become yeah. Li- they actually become liquid for more customers. It almost it, those bitcoins become more liquid when they go into GBDC because more people can invest in them, you know, in, in the regulated way. So I don't know. I just, I hear a lot about the GBTC stuff and I'm like, well, no, cause that doesn't make sense it's that it can be traded even more if you put them into GBTC. It's true that it's cold storage, but the shares are tradable. So. So, I mean, uh, I, I guess, I guess, you know, I understand what you're saying and, you know, obviously GPTC's trading price does, you know, affect Bitcoin's actual price. Uh, but at the same time, in terms of like, are Bitcoins being sold spot when they go into BTC is the answer is no, they're, they're in cold storage and only the trust is being traded. So I think that's an important sure. distinction. I'm actually going to pull up Clark Moody's dashboard really quick. And I want to see what the, uh, what the premium is right now. Oh, wait, they don't, they took the premium off. Um, okay, never mind. I take it back. Uh, the QBTC, which is this a similar fund in Canada, has a 5.7% premium. Uh, and uh, what's it called? Um, there is uh, there is now a an, a Canadian ETF that has been uh, that has been approved. So uh, I think that you know that is kind of a bullish sign for potentially a U.S. ETF coming out. Um, any kind of thoughts or, uh, or opinions on uh, the progression on that Canadian ETF and, and uh, what that could mean for the US? No, I did see that. Um, I think it's, it's bullish. There's been, I, I think there's been a European product for a long time. Uh, but an ETN. An, an ETN, yeah. So, um, no, I think it's going to happen. It's just a matter of when it does. I don't really, I don't think it will affect Bitcoin that much. I mean, it will open up maybe more Bitcoins for the kind of the investing public that's already in the stock market and stuff. So that, that could be a big deal, but overall, I, I, I don't think it's necessarily imminent or anything like that. For sure. It doesn't even matter. I mean, short term, it'll matter big time, but it won't matter long term. It's already baked in. It's already priced in. Bitcoin's going to 10 million. So it's already priced in at that price. <laughs> um, so, okay. Bitcoin going to 10 million. Do you have any comments on micro strategy? Uh, this morning, Sailor kind of stole the show. You know, Bitcoin was going to smash 50K no matter what. And then he dropped that micro strategy is doing another, uh, was it a, is it a six, uh, $6 billion, uh, $6 billion uh, bond uh bond six, uh proposal Let was it, six, it i thought it was 600 million but it might have been million six, it might have been six billion um yeah i kind of saw the headlines i didn't look into it too much but um yeah that's it's bullish sorry man. 650 million ignore my 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 uh my fake news over here it's still a lot geez in 2020 that would have been huge news but now that's kind of Oh, it's not over 1.5 billion like Tesla just did. So yeah, it's um well, it's, it's their second one though. It's second yeah. one. He's just trying to catch up with Tesla, I think. <laughs> well, I think he has more he has more Bitcoin than Tesla at a much lower cost oh, yeah. basis. Yeah. And, and Tesla hasn't gone fully public with how many Bitcoins they bought. So people yeah. are just kind of uh, guessing. 
Uh, I guess we will not find out until Tesla earnings, but uh, I'm very excited for Q2 earnings. Or sorry, uh, Q1 earnings in, in quarter two. Um, I feel like a lot of companies are going to be disclosing secrets that they have not been sharing uh, around Bitcoin so far. Yeah, I wonder who knows what. I wonder what Michael Saylor knows because there's. I have a feeling a lot of companies similar to his, not like the big companies like Apple. I think we'd hear uh, some rumors if Apple was going to be doing this, but I think a lot of mid-sized companies are going to be putting Bitcoin on their balance sheet and he probably knows a lot of them. Yeah, no, I think that he he gave him the playbook. His his conference was epic and uh, yeah. hopefully we can convince him to come to Bitcoin 2021. Um, so we're working on that. Uh, Bitcoin Magazine just dropped an interview with uh, Anthony Scaramucci and we're working on getting him over to Bitcoin 2021. Uh, so that is going to be absolutely epic. Um, Ansel, I know this wasn't on the show notes, but you just dropped a Bitcoin in markets about the lucidity strap. I can't even pronounce it. Lucidity strap. Uh, you want to kind of tease a little bit uh, that podcast and some of the you know high level education you're dropping there? Yeah. So um, this was kind of a reaction episode to Max Kaiser and Stacey Herbert. They talk a lot about the lucidity strap, and that's um, a rising power and a declining power, and how they're destined for war. Um, and that the declining power is usually the one that instigates it. That's at least according to this Thucydides trap that was uh, first stated by Graham Allison back in 2012. So on that episode, I read through his initial um, article on the Financial Times, and then I read through a rebuttal or debunk of the idea. So it was it was a fun episode to do, and I wanted to do it just to kind of push back on some of the ideas that are floating around in the space about China rising. Do you want to kind of, you know, again, you are very in touch with these central banks, these kind of uh, macro dynamics. Do you have any kind of like last comments about China that you want to give to the audience? No, I mean, it's been very quiet leading up to this lunar new year and we'll just see what kind of news comes in the next couple months. They, they, I think they are going towards a large financial crisis. Um, the Japanese miracle was about 40 years, and now the Chinese miracle has been about 40 years. They both achieved roughly the same um, size of global GDP at 17 and 18 um, percent. Their debt levels are roughly the same. If you look at 1990 debt levels of Japan and 2020 debt levels of China. So there's so many similarities. We even have the rhetoric is the same. Back in 1990, we're all turning Japanese now, and Japan, Japan was going to overtake the US and we were all worried about Honda destroying GM and stuff like that. And now we're hearing the exact same rhetoric out of China. So I just caution people, don't be too bullish on China. Yeah, I mean, I don't know as much as Ansel, um, but I just distrust central de centralized top-down decision-making. You know, even if they were doing it perfect up to this point, you know, they're going to make mistakes. And uh, I, I just don't think that top-down decision-making is better than a free market. The thing that scares me is just seeing uh, the U.S. sliding into top-down decision-making. So uh, I'm bullish on states like Florida and states' rights kind of, you know, being a barrier, being friction to that. But uh, it's been very, very clear that the President Biden and the leadership there um, are all about top-down decision-making and decrees, uh, which bearish in my opinion uh so we'll we'll see if the u.s can uh can wrestle can wrestle that away and continue on its way and hopefully uh ride bitcoin back to dominance you know that that would be absolutely epic um, yeah, I, saw your, I saw your tweet on the jurisdictional arbitrage between the states you want to comment yeah. on that yeah let's i mean i think that's a great uh idea in my mind i think it's super important so <laughs> can you explain it to us well, I mean, so here, here's a reality. If you live in France, if you live in the UK, if you live in almost every country, whatever the, you know, president leadership kind of decrees is the law of the land everywhere. But here we have in the US, you know, California is completely locked down, but Utah's not locked down. Nevada's not locked down. Arizona's not locked down. Uh, Texas, Florida, they're not locked down. And you can see people are moving. People are literally getting up, 
saying, I'm leaving this place and I'm going to this other place. They don't lose any of their value. They can hold all of their, you know, equities, stocks. They can have all of their bank balances, their ID, the identification system, property rights system. It all still works, right? And they can go and they can live somewhere else. So there's this like domestic regulatory arbitrage that's going on. Uh, and I think that that's what makes that's what makes America great. And I'm bullish on the world and I'm bullish on Bitcoin because I think Bitcoin brings that kind of interoperability, jurisdictional state right op- interoperability to the world. And uh, yeah, you know, right now borders are still pretty tough, but um, I think Bitcoin is going to knock down some of those borders and make these jurisdictions more interoperable and make them compete more. Um, so. Again, seeing Florida kind of go after New York and Los Angeles and San Francisco and see Miami, you know, trying to make itself appealing to, you know, tech money, to uh, to young people, to attractive people saying, hey, we're free here. It's open here. You can have fun here. Uh, I think that, you know, I think that that kind of posturing from jurisdictions is going to continue happening in the US. And I, and I hope that it expands globally and becomes more easily for individuals to kind of navigate. Yeah, and they compete on the right things versus, you know, like in the European Union, Germany is competing against France, like, on a GDP scale, on an unemployment scale, on all, you know, uh, social services and all these other things. It seems like the United States, obviously, Um, is competing on the kind of fiscal laws and the certain maybe uh, the surface rights, but they have everything else the same. So I thought, yeah, I I agree that the U.S. extremely bullish um, on the U.S. Yeah, I think the states in the United States framework is much, much better than the countries in the EU framework. Uh, I think the EU actually went super backwards with their strategy. And I was speaking to Peter McCormick uh, on a recent podcast I did with him uh, for what Bitcoin did. And he was saying, like, you know, he was on the fence about Brexit. But when he saw how the EU was trying to block AstraZeneca vaccines from going into the UK, uh, because they're no longer part of the EU and they're trying to put this massive premium on them, like he started to understand that, no, the EU is not it's not flattening. It's actually putting up barriers. It's actually stopping competition. Uh, so it, I think it's a, it's a very backwards organization and uh, we're going to continue seeing them grasping for air with all of these ECB comments. Um, you know, I think until, until there's a massive change. Excellent. Well, that's all I have for this episode. All right. Well, uh, let's wrap it up. You guys can find me at CK underscore snarks. You can find me also at Bitcoin magazine. And in June, you can find me in Miami at Bitcoin 2021. I'm hoping we can get Ansel there. Um, He doesn't like to leave his personal citadel. uh, But Ansel, where can people find you, sir? Bitcoin and markets.com. You'll find everything you need to know about uh, my other podcast and my discord community and my Twitter. Awesome. And make sure you use code satoshi to get that 10 percent off guys don't miss out on it all right peace